Namaste and greetings. I, Arunima Marva, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evam Niti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nai Delhi, extend my warmest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today we are gathered for a special discussion on informal leadership and development in India's urban slums by Dr. Adam Auerbach. This deliberation is a part of the State of Cities, hashtag City Conversations series, and is organized by Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, CHURS, in pre. The moderator for our deliberation and our City Conversation series is Dr. Samyadeep Chattopadhyay. Sir is an associate professor at Viswabharti Santi Niketan and a visiting senior fellow at IMPRI, New Delhi. We are glad to have you here. Welcome to the session. Our esteemed speaker for today's talk is Dr. Adam Auerbach. Sir is an associate professor at the School of International Service at American University. His research focuses on local governance, urban politics, and the political economy of development with a regional focus on India. We welcome you, sir. Thank you. Moving to our esteemed discussions for today, we have with us Dr. Pushpa Pathak, who is a senior visiting fellow at the Center for Policy Research, New Delhi. We are honored to have you, ma'am. Welcome to the session. Thank you. We are delighted to have with us Dr. Lalita Kamath, who is an associate professor at the School of Habitat Studies, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, TIS, Mumbai. We welcome you, ma'am. Thank you. Now I invite our moderator, Dr. Chattopadhyay, to initiate the talk with his opening remarks and to proceed with the deliberation further. We look forward to learning from the esteemed gathering. Thank you. Thank you, Arunima, and uh, good evening to all of you from Shantiniketan. Uh, on behalf of uh, the charts at IMPRI, I welcome you all to this City Conversation series. Uh, this charts, at, we started this series in 2019, and the aim is to invite the urban experts and practitioners to discuss and uh, deliberate on diverse issues related to urban developments, urban policies, uh, urban policy making and policy implementation. And we are uh, fortunate to have uh, with us renowned urban experts from different countries uh, sharing their ideas, which are uh, very useful to better understand the contemporary urban challenges and, and some, some plausible pathways to overcome them. And today's topic, uh, informal leadership, and development in India's uh, urban slum uh, is very interesting. And urban population in India has been rising rapidly as millions of migrants are moving to the urban areas, uh, aspiring for higher earnings and better living. And uh, the slums are often the first destination of the rural urban migrants. The number of urban poor is also growing. A significant number of these poor uh, find spaces in slums and, and continue to uh, to struggle for better living standards. The slums, as we all know, uh, exhibit uh, uh, sort of uneven access to public goods. And we need to understand why and how this happens. And failure to solve the problems in urban slums is uh, not only an issue of uh, human deprivation, but also uh, an implement, uh, a, a, an impediment uh, to, to India's strive for economic growth. So how to respond to this problem? It is, it is, it is well known that uh, that the public resources for urban services are limited and, and access through a complex wave of political relationships. In fact, there are a number of important questions. Uh, the answer to some of them are not yet properly understood. For example, why do some slums have better provisioning of urban services than others? Or, or like, uh, why it is the some, that some communities are able to successfully demand the provision of public goods, which uh, while the others fail. So there are heterogeneities among the slum dwellers uh, living in the same slum, across the slums in the same political jurisdiction, or between the slum dwellers and some more affluent communities in the same area in terms of their 
access to basic services in terms of their ability to demand services. So there is there is a literature emphasizing on uh, this client listed relationship between uh, the politicians and the poor voters. Politicians often acting uh, through their uh, agents like slum lords or or local leaders. They provide voters with goods and services uh, which they cannot access through the normal bureaucratic system in return of for, for political support. Uh, Partho Chatterjee expresses one specific uh, version of this view when he argues that uh, uh, the poor work through the political channels, whereas more affluent citizens, they stake their claims to directly engaging with the bureaucracy and the government agencies. Even uh, 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 this, this does not mean that every uh, slum dwellers, they will have access to every services he or she wants, given the city's limited budget. Uh, it may not be feasible to match the demand and, and supply of all the services. So there is a limit to what politicians can deliver, what the Islam leaders can deliver. So it is important to understand the uh, sort of uh, the, the nature of goals, the incentives, the networks of these actors and what sorts of activities do they engage in. Uh, but the problem is that uh, the systematic evidence is lacking on on the vast range of conditions within and across slums. There is little information available to, to, devise, uh, uh, to devise evidence based policies for improving the well being and urban poverty reduction by taking into account the, the varying needs of the people in slums. And today uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Adam Orbeck to deliberate on some of these issues. And also we have with us uh, Dr. Lita Kamath and uh, Dr. Pushpa Patak uh, as, as discussed. And so we really uh, look forward to listen to today's speakers and the discussions to understand some of the complexities which are inherent in of, of this Indian slum. So with these few words, let me now uh, once again uh, welcome to all the uh, panelists and today's speaker uh, for uh, attending uh, today's, uh, today's, uh, uh, today's City Conversation series. And uh, now uh, let me now invite uh, Dr. Adam to... Uh, start his presentation. It's over to you, Dr. Okay. <clears throat> well, thank you so much uh, for the introductions and good morning, everybody from a very rainy Washington, DC. Uh, but it's, it's so exciting to be here with you all. Um, and please let me start by thanking um, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Dr. Somya Deep Chattopadhyay, and the entire IMPRI team, you know, for not only organizing this event, but this entire series on the state of cities. Um, which I've learned so much from, you know, listening to past conversations, and it's it's a real honor to be able to contribute to that conversation uh, today. Please let me also thank Dr. Lalitha Kamath and Dr. Pushpa Patak for joining us. Um, it's also a real honor to be here with with both of you, and I can't wait to hear, you know, your comments on, you know, what I've shared in my presentation today. Um, so, as the title suggests, um, and as Dr. Chattopadhyay suggested. Um, what I'll be talking about today is um, the emergence and role of informal leadership, uh, busti netas, um, in India's slum settlements and how that is tied to community level development. Um, and what I'll be presenting on is based on what is now about 10 years of uh, field work and research and writing um, on these subjects. So very much looking forward to sharing this with you all. Okay. So just to provide a, a quick roadmap of um, where I'd like to go in the next 20, 25 minutes or so, um, first, I'll provide a very brief overview um, of my forthcoming co-authored book, Migrants and Machine Politics, How India's Urban Poor Seek Representation and Responsiveness. Um, and this is co-authored with Tarek Tachal, um, who's based at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, much of the data from the presentation uh, comes from migrants and machine politics. Um, and what is now eight years of collaborative fieldwork, survey research, um, and writing with Tarek. Um, after introducing our book, um, I'll turn to the specific themes um, of today's presentation, understanding how informal leadership is constructed um, in informal slum settlements, and especially the role of ordinary residents in that construction. I'll then turn to describing the activities um, of slum leaders, drawing on a original survey of 629 uh, slum leaders um, across 110 slum settlements in Jaipur, Rajasthan, and Bhopal, Madhya Pradesh. Um, and, and then I'll conclude with some thoughts on why does this all matter um, in thinking about community level development and in particular development interventions um, by organizations, um, municipal, municipalities and the government uh, within informal settlements. Okay, so yeah, here's, here's the, uh, we, we just recently got the, the book cover design. So here's uh, Migrants and Machine Politics. It should be coming out in January or February of 2023 um, with Princeton University Press. 
Um, the book is really centered on what is one of the most arresting demographic changes unfolding right now in the global south. Um, we've already crossed the 50% mark in terms of the percentage of people living in the global south who are living in cities. And um, this is expected to increase to 64% um, just within the next three decades. Um, and staggeringly, 86% of global population growth um, in that same time span um, will be uh, occurring not only within the global south, but within cities in the global south, especially within sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. Um, as as all, everyone on the call certainly knows, um, much of this urbanization is marked by pervasive forms of informality, um, both in terms of housing and in terms of economic activity. So UN Habitat estimates that um, just under 1 billion people worldwide resi reside in slum or squatter settlements, um, areas with um, uh, you know, little or no uh, strength of property rights, marginalized access to basic public goods and services, um, dense living conditions, um, often on environmentally sensitive lands. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's estimated that 62% of people living in cities uh, reside in slum settlements. And in South Asia, that number is estimated to be about 35%. Um, in terms of economic activity, much of this urban population um, is understood to work in the informal sector. Um, with little regulatory oversights, um, very little in the way of security of wages, um, and little or no social protections. In, in terms of the picture in India, um, and certainly these numbers are quite dated now, drawing on the census of 2011, um, but I think we can all agree that um, India's urban population now certainly exceeds 400 million people, um, more than a third of the population. Um, it's estimated that about half of India's population will live in cities um, by 2050. Um, and in that time span, India will be adding 416 million urban dwellers. Um, and this is the largest projected increase in the world in absolute numbers. Um, and India cities too um, are marked by widespread informality. Um, again, drawing on the census of 2011, it's estimated that about 65 million people live in India's slum settlements. And the vast majority um, of uh, those residents are toiling in the informal sector. So our book is framed around the following question. How are poor migrants coming from the countryside, moving to cities um, to experience that socioeconomic upward mobility, um, contributing to this um, rapid urbanization? How are they being, if at all, politically incorporated um, into India's cities? Um, and what we argue in our book is that this is a question that really sits at the heart of the future and current state of India's democracy. Each chapter of our book takes an analytical slice and understanding a distinct arena of politics in the formation of political networks. Um, that once um, poor migrants move um, and are, are setting up um, or living within uh, squatter settlements in particular. Um, so in, in Jaipur and Bhopal, these, these are referred to as Kachi Bustis, um, you know, Jugi Jopuris in Delhi, Zoparpatis uh, in Mumbai. Um, how do political networks form within these communities after the dust of squatting settles? Um, and then how do networks form, if at all, between these settlements and the wider world of urban politics in the city? So what I'll be discussing today are findings from chapter two of our book primarily. Um, and chapter two asks, once the dust of squatting settles, how does informal leadership emerge within India's urban slums? Um, what preferences do residents have over who their slum leaders are? Um, and through what processes, if any, um, can they actually express those preferences in selecting who is their local informal leader? Just to give you a sense of where the other chapters go before turning to chapter two, chapter three then sort of inverts the arrow downward. Once slum leaders emerge, um, what are the determinants of their downward responsiveness um, to the needs of residents in their communities? Um, you know, if, if any, if, if you spend time in these communities, um, you know, they're very much um, marginalized in terms of access to basic public goods and services. Residents are oftentimes turning to their informal leaders to gain access to goods and services. Um, but with limited time and in the context of widespread material deprivation, um, some leaders need to decide who am I going to privilege and who am I not going to privilege. Um, and so chapter three seeks to disentangle um, why they're unevenly responsive to different resident claims. Chapter four then takes a step outside of the settlement and asks how do political elites, politicians in the city, um, how do they decide among the small army of slum leaders in any sort of corner of their constituency to absorb within their political party organizations? Um, and so, you know, within Jaipur and Bhopal, we're really talking about the BJP and the Congress. 
who are they going to give party positions, PUDs, uh, to in, the, in their party um, and make them PADADIKARI, um, um, you know, position holding party workers within the party organization. The final chapter then asks, um, given the sort of everyday claims um, that bubble upward uh, from slum settlements to gain access to goods and services, why are politicians responsive to some claims um, made by these neighborhoods and their constituencies and not others? Um, the book itself is based on um, over two years of ethnographic field work um, in Kutchi Bustis in Bhopal and Jaipur. Um, a number of surveys, so two waves of surveys um, of um, ordinary residents, um, the first across 80 slum settlements in Jaipur and Bhopal, and the second across 110 uh, settlements. Um, a survey of 629 informal slum leaders, um, and also a survey of municipal politicians in Jaipur and Bhopal, uh, 343. Um, we also did hundreds of open-ended interviews with these same sets of actors. Um, and in addition to that, we collected several thousand what we call informal archival documents, um, things that are typically held within Kachibastis. Um, so these would be petitions for goods and services, uh, community meeting notes, um, and various political ephemera that oftentimes would stretch back to the 1960s and 1970s um, that really gave us an up-close um, view on the, the micro histories of these neighborhoods. Um, especially in combination with our open end interviews. Okay, so I'd like to turn now to describing um, India's slum leaders um, themselves. So just to give you uh, an example, um, and of course I've changed the names of these, these actors and settlements. Um, not far from Jaipur's train station um, is a settlement um, that's referred to as Mazdornagar. Um, and you know, to give you an example of one of these, um, of, of a slum leader, of a, of a busty neta, um, this is Mr. Qureshi. Uh, Mr. Qureshi um, runs a Kirana Dukan, um, a general store in his neighborhood um, where he sells basic provisions. Um, but what his real main job is, is that he's an informal leader in the community. Um, on an everyday basis, residents are turning to him to gain access to the state. Um, so this one resident you can see in this picture is asking Mr. Qureshi to, to help him get access to a ration cart, um, to get subsidized access to food and fuel. Um, Mr. Qureshi also helps people in the community get access to water taps, um, electricity connections, you know, after the monsoon, um, paving over uh, potholes. Um, during elections then, um, Mr. Qureshi mobilizes residents behind the political party that he's attached to, the Congress party. Um, Mr. Qureshi is the Upadyaksh, the vice president um, of the Congress party in his particular ward. Um, and so in between elections, he's doing all these problem solving activities for residents. Um, but then he takes those networks um, that he's built um, you know, through his own entrepreneurial sweat um, and converts them into mobilizational capacity for his party during elections. So more generally, India slum leaders, I mean, these are non-state actors. Um, they're not formally elected in, in formal elections. Um, they're not um, agents of the state. They're non-state actors. They emerge from within settlements. Um, they move to the settlements like any other resident in the community. And because of certain characteristics that I'll be outlining in the, later in the presentation, other residents gravitate towards them because of their problem solving capacity. Um, uh, and what we, what we learned from our survey too is that um, almost none of these um, informal actors sort of had plans to go into politics when they moved to the settlements. Um, so this is something that very much happens after the settlement forms. Um, as I just noted, um, they spearhead efforts um, to improve local conditions. Um, also mobilizing residents during elections and rallies. And as I'll show you with the survey data from the 629 slum leaders um, that we've surveyed, most of them have a position, a PUD, um, within a party organization. Um, so to provide some more concrete numbers, um, these actors are absolutely pervasive. Um, across the 110 slum settlements in our sample, 70% um, of residents acknowledged informal leadership in the settlements. Um, most of those who did not acknowledge them, it was more of, of a, um, an assessment of the quality of leadership, not, not, not um, evidence of their absence. Um, but in only three of 110 settlements did we not have a single respondent acknowledge informal leadership. So you can, you can essentially assume, um, again, at least within uh, Jaipur and Bhopal and certainly other cities that we visited, um, that there will be informal leadership in the vast majority of settlements. Not only is um, informal leadership pervasive across settlements, but it's also multifocal within settlements. It's extremely rare for there to just be one um, informal slum leader in a settlement, even in a quite small settlement. 
um, we uh, enumerated 664 party workers across these 110 slum settlements, and there were over 1,200 acknowledged informal leaders um, with varying levels of popularity um, across the 110 slum settlements. They're also really important for problem solving. Um, uh, just over 65% of residents said that either they themselves or a member of their family turned to a bus bimita, turned to a slum leader to seek help with a problem. Um, and much of this stems with the, from the difficulty of ordinary residents approaching the state by themselves. An earlier survey that I conducted for um, my first book that came out a few years ago, I asked residents if you went by yourself um, to a government official or a politician to ask for help, um, would you get attention? Only 12% of residents believe that they would actually be able to get the attention um, of you know, people in the municipality, of the district collector, politicians by themselves. Um, there's a great deal of despondency um, in their expectations of state responsiveness when it's not being mediated by an informal slum leader. Um, so this drives much of the demand um, for these actors um, to serve in that intermediary role between ordinary residents and the state. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is describe how do these actors actually emerge? Um, there's a really vibrant and rich literature, um, uh, certainly on in urban informality in India. Um, many people on the call have richly contributed to that literature um, and, and have mentioned um, and have studied uh, informal slum leadership. Um, there's, there's much less work though done on historicizing how these actors actually come to be um, and what the, what the preferences of residents are um, and how they are selected. So in India's um, urban slum settlements, first of all, these are extremely diverse spaces in terms of jati, um, in terms of religion, and in terms of state of origin. Um, I mean, just to give you a, a sense of that, um, social scientists oftentimes uh, rely on a measure called a fractionalization index, um, which is bound between zero and one. Um, and it represents the probability that two randomly selected people in that group belong to a different group. Um, and so the ELF measure, the fractionalization score for Jati, for instance, and across our, our 110 sampled slum settlements is 0.8. That means there's an 80% chance in the average settlement that if you randomly pick two people from the community, they would be from a different Jati. That's extremely diverse. Um, it's just under 20% uh, for religion. So most settlements in our sample have both, um, and this, this is predominantly Hindus and Muslims living next to one another in the same neighborhood. Um, and it's even a even higher number, around 30% uh, for state of origin, um, two randomly selected people um, having migrated from a different state. Um, so these are extremely diverse spaces where um, hereditary titles or customary authority um, that might be um, hold some degree of social currency in the villages where people have migrated from are no longer relevant in the city. Um, and so informal leadership has to be constructed from scratch. Um, when these communities uh, first come up off the ground. Um, as I noted, slum leadership is multifocal, it's contested. Um, slum leaders um, you know, uh, compete with, with one another intensely between and during elections, even within the same party to have the biggest following. Um, and so because of this competition um, and because of the novel nature of informal leadership in these communities, what we find both qualitative and quantitative evidence for is that residents have significant political agency in who they turn to to seek help and follow. We also find that parties do not, they're not sort of dispatching people to go live in some settlements to represent the party. Um, they also can't simply tap somebody in the neighborhood and say, now you are the neta. That process very much happens internally. And then political party leaders outside of the settlements will seek to sort of latch on to informal leaders that have already sort of emerged from within the neighborhood itself. So because of this, we argue a key, a key analytical concern are resident preferences for informal slum leadership. Um, so just to give you a sense from some, some of the interviews that we did, um, you know, and this is very representative of um, sort of the corpus of interviews that we've collected. Um, as, was, as one resident noted, slum leaders help us because the residents of the Busti have chosen them as their leader. Slum leaders help the poor people who have no one in government to go to. We have chosen them for a reason. The slum leaders live among us. Um, so it is their responsibility to help someone who approaches them with a problem. We have chosen them as leaders um, because, of, um, because they have information and knowledge. They should get our work done. Political party elites in the BJP and the Congress said uh, very similar things. As one party elite told us, see, there's always leaders in the bustees. Some people who are active and working for people, 
Our party needed someone like this in the settlement. It was through such people that we strengthened our position in the Busties. These are the individuals we would select for a party position. Another political elite. See, someone from the community emerges as a strong leader, has a public following, has a strong influence. In that case, we must approach him and offer him a position. Third, we can't make someone a Neta just by giving them Neta clothes and making them stand on the road. In that case, he would just be a Morthi, a statue. Um, they must have the support of residents. So through our qualitative field work, we identify two key pathways um, through which informal leaders are selected. The first pathway are these episodic discrete events where large groups of people in a settlement come together, sometimes in sort of a beta, you know, coming and sitting in a, in a circle, um, sometimes in a larger crowd um, to deliberate um, and discuss who is best fit to be our neta. Um, and in some cases, this takes the form of an actual informal community election where they come up with uh, paper ballots on their own. 50% of our survey respondents um, across the 110 slum settlements who acknowledge informal leadership said that they had selected those leaders in these sorts of group meetings. Um, and 38% of our sampled slum leaders um, acknowledged that they were selected in these sorts of ways. So to give you a concrete example, one of the communities that I spent um, uh, uh, three or four months in of ethnographic fieldwork in Eastern Jaipur, Saraswati Basti. Um, in the late 2000s, uh, Saraswati was under threat of eviction um, because the settlement is settled on Vangibag, on uh, forest department land. And so people in the community got together and decided we need an adyaksh, a president, a Basti Neta to help lead and push back against the eviction attempts. Three residents came forward um, and the community set up an informal election with actual paper ballots, uh, ballot boxes, candidates gave speeches, um, and Jagdish defeated Prem um, by 141 votes um, and became the adyaksh um, of the Basti. Um, and this is you know, some images of you know, after the victory, um, he then went to choose the other members of the Vikas Samiti um, of the Development Association, and they're promising before residents to help them um, gain Vikas development for the community. So there are these episodic events um, that take those forms. Um, there is also another pathway that's much more everyday, much more fluid. These are the everyday choices of individual residents over who among the existing crop of informal leaders in my community am I going to turn to for help? Um, who am I gonna follow? Um, and this then determines the distribution of supports uh, for informal leaders across the community. Um, so really capturing the fluidity of these decisions, um, is this following uh, interview quote. There is one Neta who people stopped following um, after I came to the slum because I knew more than him. I knew everything about the system. Whether you go to the public health and engineering department, the municipal corporation, the electricity board, the Jaipur Development Authority, or the collectorate, I knew how to solve these problems related to the departments. Hence that leader became less popular. So a new individual moves to the settlements, starts growing a following, more people turn to him um, because of his ability and know-how in navigating the state and the following of the previous NEPA in that corner of the neighborhood atrophied. Okay, so we, I've just motivated the fact that residents actually have significant scope for selecting um, who their informal leaders are. So what then do they look for in their informal leaders? So to, 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 to examine this, we conducted a conjoint survey experiment um, with just under 2,200 residents across the 110 slum settlements in Bhopal and Jaipur. Um, and if you're interested in, in looking uh, more closely at the findings, um, they're published in a 2018 article on the American Political Science Review, um, and a revised and extended version of that chapter is chapter two of our, of our book. So just to give you a very quick summary of the findings, because um, I want to get onto why I think this all matters, of course, for community development efforts in these neighborhoods, um, so first um, and foremost, we find strong experimental evidence that education is especially important preference for residents, for slum leaders. Um, that residents want um, slum leaders who are well-educated because this underwrites their ability to navigate the state and to engage in petition writing, um, which is really sort of a cornerstone of claim making in these communities. Um, so as two um, residents told us, see, you need two things to become a slum leader, Jagruta and Jankari. These qualities are needed to solve problems. Here in the slum, we have only poor people. Most people are uneducated. When there's an issue, they need help writing applications. They come to me and say, bye, brother, fill out this application. Slowly people told others that I do this work. That's how I built my support. 
so education is, is crucial um, in, in forming preferences over who is going to be a informal slum leader. We also find experimental evidence that residents prefer leaders that have some sort of modest connectivity to the Nagar Nigam, to the municipality. Um, and this is usually takes the form of some sort of modest occupational connectivity. Um, that that individual is a chaprasi in the, in the municipality, a municipal clerk, or they are a chopidar for the municipality, a, a guard, or they are a safai karamchari for the, for the municipality, so a municipal sweeper. Um, modest public jobs, but ones that have that, connect, that, that connection um, to the municipality um, that can help um, facilitate claim making efforts for residents. So as one resident told us, even if a man is just a chokidar, a security guard at the municipal office, his bosses will be important people he sees every day. So if he asks them to make sure the municipality sends sweepers to clean our gutters, won't it be more likely that they listen to him? Um, we also find experimental evidence that residents prefer leaders that do belong to their own jati, religion, and state. But interestingly, because these communities are so incredibly diverse, it is actually quite uncommon for a resident to have someone of their own jati um, who is an informal leader. So only 30% of our sampled residents actually had someone of their jati who was an informal slum leader. Um, so the vast majority of people are turning to people other than their own jati um, to get help. So there might be an, uh, sort of a generalized preference um, to have someone of your jati as a slum leader, but most people don't in practice actually have one. Um, and so they're turning to people of jatis other than their own. Um, and then a final preference that we find through our experimental, um, or through our experiments, um, is that residents do prefer co-partisans. So if you support the BJP, you prefer a BJP slum leader. Um, and if you are Congress, you, you, um, you prefer to have a Congress slum leader. Okay, so I mean, just quickly in these last few minutes, um, we didn't um, just want to hang our hat on our experimental findings. Um, we wanted to actually sample um, slum leaders and see how are they actually systematically different from ordinary residents in these communities. Um, so I'd be happy to talk more about this if people are interested, but um, what we do is we end up surveying 629 slum leaders, um, which is a response rate of about 70% um, across these 110 slum settlements. And we argue that this is, this is quite representative um, of the population of slum leaders um, in Jaipur and Bhopal, at least. Um, just to give you some descriptive statistics, um, the 629 slum leaders are incredibly diverse, just like the communities that they come from. They represent 160 different jati. Um, they are religiously diverse. Just over 70% were Hindu, um, about 27% were Muslim. Overwhelmingly, they're from Rajasthan and Madhya Pradesh, the two states where Jaipur and Bhopal are, of course, situated within. They are mostly men. Um, and I'll briefly discuss um, some of our findings on women slum leaders, um, but about 88% are men. Um, and the vast majority are affiliated with either the Congress party or the BJP. Um, just like what we found in our experimental findings, slum leaders are indeed on average, significantly more educated than your ordinary residents. Um, they're educated um, for just over eight, um, eight years of formal schooling, um, which compares to about five years of formal schooling for your ordinary resident in the community. 90% of sampled slum leaders were literate, um, compared to about 62% of ordinary residents. And slum leaders are also twice as likely to have um, some amount of college education. Um, so just under 20% of our slum leaders had um, at least a year of college education. Um, in terms of the, that connectivity, that occupational connectivity to the municipality, uh, we find that slum leaders are roughly four times more likely to have um, a high status um, job that puts them in some degree of proximity to um, power centers within the city. Um, I had mentioned that residents do have preferences for um, co-ethnic slum leaders, but they oftentimes don't have the opportunity to do so. One other interesting sort of data point on this is that we asked our sampled slum leaders, can you please name the jati of the last five people that have come to you to ask for help? 77% um, gave at least one um, residence um, out of the last five that have come to them that belongs to a jati other than their own. Um, in our, in our, and um, in the 79 of the 110 slum settlements in our sample that have both Hindus and Muslims within them, 46% of slum leaders reported to have multi-religious client bases. So clearly residents who are Muslim are turning to Hindu slum leaders, um, residents who are Hindu are turning to Muslim slum leaders. Um, really sort of underscoring the importance of what is the, the degree of efficacy that a leader can have in helping to solve problems, that people are very much willing to overlook differences in religion or jati um, if they're going to be getting help and effective help from someone. 
Um, just quickly, um, and I'd be happy to talk more about this if people are interested, but um, so it's only 12% of our sample of slum leaders are women. Um, but you know, during my two years of uh, qualitative work for the, for the project, um, many of the female slum leaders are, were, were many of the most firebrand um, slum leaders that I encountered during my field work. Um, in at least half of the um, slum settlements that we sampled, um, there was at least one female slum leader. 75% of them have a position within a party, many of them um, within the Mahila Morcha, um, the women's wing within the Congress or BJP. Um, oh, no uh, female slum leaders um, uh, described be being homemakers. Um, they overwhelmingly have some sort of job, um, which is very different from your or ordinary female residents in the communities. Um, they're, excuse me, they're much more likely to um, have some sort of um, modest um, public job um, or have some sort of small business than ordinary uh, women in the communities. They're less um, educated than male slum leaders. Um, and interestingly, they're, they're significantly more likely to be widows. 20% uh, of the female slum leaders in our sample were widows um, compared to 7% of female residents. Okay, so just um, to quickly wrap up um, and then I'll get to the conclusion. Um, and, and I've already sort of described this in other ways, but through our survey data, um, we find that slum leaders are doing a variety of activities. Um, they're helping people get ration cards, voter ID cards, BPL cards, organizing money collections for residents um, who get sick or hurt or go to the hospital, um, organizing community meetings to discuss developments, uh, resolving disputes, dealing with the police, making claims, spreading information about public programs. Um, so there's, there's a huge menu of activities that they do. Why do they do this? Um, well, for lots of different reasons um, that, that, that emerge from our qualitative field work. First, um, they're gaining ordinary rents um, from uh, everyday rents from residents. Um, so uh, when someone comes to you asking for help to get a ration card, um, oftentimes uh, they're asking for say two, three, 400 rupees for that help. Um, and when you ask some leaders about that, they'll say, well, if I'm gonna spend several hours at the district collector's office helping somebody get something, why, why should I not be compensated for that? Um, but there's this everyday sort of stream of rents that they get for problem solving in the community. During elections, uh, popular slum leaders make handsome amounts of money from political parties, um, sometimes the equivalent of several months of income for uh, other residents in their community. Um, many of them are um, extremely ambitious. This is um, one of the subjects that we touch on in our book. Um, there, many of them are not just satisfied with being a bastinita forever. Um, they want to get a ticket to fight in the municipal election. Um, and so that they know that doing these sort of nitagiri activities, these problem solving activities, um, will propel them upward within the party and hopefully um, give them a, a position. Um, and then finally, and th this cannot be overlooked, um, slum leaders are residents of the settlement. They live with their families. Um, they are also facing eviction. They're also facing underdevelopment. Um, and so many of them would articulate what some of the reasons why they do leadership activities because it immediately benefits them and their families um, and their neighbors and friends within the community. So just some concluding thoughts. So first, um, our, our book really, um, um, underscores the fact that residents of India slums really have substantial political agency in selecting who are their informal slum leaders. These are actors that are not imposed on them from above. Um, this is not to suggest that informal slum leaders, um, you know, are, are not doing anything that we might sort of um, construe as gundagiri, um, but these are not, you know, the, the picture of informal leaders that we render in our book based on, on several years of field work is not the image of, you know, the gang leader um, popularized in, in film and media. Um, these are much more complex actors um, that are certainly getting many things for doing um, slum leadership, um, but in the process um, are, are, are seeking to improve um, their communities. <coughs> um, both our ethnographic and experimental findings show that non-ethnic, so non-jati, non-religious indicators of a, of a slum leader's efficacy, especially their education, um, can, tr can trump um, uh, preferences for co-ethnicity. Um, so education itself is the most important attribute that slum leaders look for, um, excuse me, that residents look for in their slum leaders. Um, and then finally, um, you know, a proliferating sort of um, framework of development um, right now is community-driven development, harnessing local participation, harnessing local associational life um, in local um, community development projects. Um, and this is certainly something that's proliferating within India cities as well. Um, if you read, for instance, you know, during the height of my field work in the early 2010s, you know, Rajiva Wasiojana was unfolding. Um, you know, there, there's an entire sort of, um, you know, booklet um, about how municipalities should be engaging the participation of communities 
um, in coming up with community maps, um, coming up with community preferences over what sort of projects that they want. Um, and so what we argue and you know, is an implication of our finding is that it's really essential in understanding what are the factors that underpin informal leadership. These are, these are actors that um, oftentimes enjoy significant legitimacy um, in, the, in communities, and they're very unlikely to be sort of swept aside or circumvented by external agencies um, that want to, for instance, create a new community-based organization from scratch. So for, again, to go back to Rajiva Wasyojana, you know, part of the booklet explicitly says that you know, CBOs, community-based organizations, should not be led by people that are connected to political parties. Um, that effort to sort of depoliticize local development in these communities um, is, is in many ways sort of glazing over the, the nature um, and you know, crystallized forms of informal leadership in these communities that are otherwise um, assisting residents in a quotidian everyday basis. Um, if these leaders are so important, and we certainly believe that they are, um, it also suggests the need to understand who are they responsive to? Um, that if you are an, an organization seeking to do development in these neighborhoods, um, you know, perhaps it's best to understand who is being left out um, from the responsiveness of informal slum leaders. So clearly women are dramatically underrepresented among um, the numbers of slum leaders. Um, and there's of course a large literature um, suggesting, you know, that, that that has many detrimental effects in terms of advancing the interests um, of women. Um, we also find, this is in chapter three of our book, that um, slum leaders target co-partisans. Um, so if you sort of uh, belong to a party that's not in power um, and it's not represented by your slum leader, you could be marginalized. Um, and they target residents who are best positioned to boost their own reputations within the community. Um, so especially if you're a new resident um, or you're otherwise not really well socially connected within the community, um, you can often be marginalized. And then one final comment, and I'm really looking forward to the discussion, um, the politics that we describe in our book is a politics that's highly fragmented. This is community level organization. These are individual slum leaders making claims on behalf of their neighborhoods. There's very little intersettlement organization. Um, I mean, the last time that you know, I, I really observed this in Jaipur and Bhopal was reading about um, you know, the, the Communist Party, especially in Bhopal in the 1960s and 70s, seeking to organize people as a larger class in the city. Um, the politics um, of, uh, you know, in, in formal settlements, you know, at least in Jaipur and Bhopal are highly fragmented. Um, and so this is unlikely to yield larger programmatic changes um, to benefit the urban poor as a class um, who are living in informal settlements. Um, so there's also a real need for sort of intersettlement organization to push for these larger changes. Uh, but yeah, I'll leave it there. But thank you all so much um, uh, for listening to the presentation. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adam, for this uh, sort of revealing portrait of local claim making and uh, the problem solving networks in India's urban slums. And regarding the emergence of uh, the slum leaders, uh, your arguments uh, provide a, a refreshing change from these traditional studies of violence and these typical pattern client relationship which we find in the uh, literature. Uh, uh, the performance of the slum leaders, it appears that. Uh, uh, that do matter. The slum residents are, are actively uh, uh, selecting their brokers to represent their political interest and, and uh, to convincingly make claims in the city, uh, which of course entails uh, significant implications for the representativeness or the inclusiveness, especially uh, who is represented and responded to within these, these informal networks. And also it seems that this this brokered method of uh, interventions are heavily tilted uh, towards everyday problem solving. Much less attention is, is paid to the, uh, say, some of the larger policy issues, for example, how to make the urban policy policies truly inclusive. But uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, this, 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 this is a really a very uh, a nice uh, presentation. And I am, uh, there are lots of uh, fine, finer points which uh, have emerged from your presentation. and. Let me now uh, request uh, our discussion today uh, to share uh, uh, their comments on your presentation. So let me first invite uh, uh, Dr. Kamath to please share your views. It's over to you, uh, Dr. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Samyadi. Um, and uh, Adam, thank you so much for that presentation. It was uh, most insightful. Um, there are so many, many things I think I really enjoyed about the work. Uh, I will confine myself here, however, to just maybe two main points. 
Uh, one of the things that I really liked is I think the focus on the agency of people um, in pre preferring uh, certain brokers. And it's also very much also the story of broker agency. Um, and here very much showcasing the power of alternative narratives, uh, explaining the rise of slum leaders. Uh, what's particularly interesting here is that you also give us a sense of the diversity, the plurality of these kinds of stories and pathways. Um, and that I think is something also really worthwhile um, to, because I think that's something that all researchers really have to grapple with, you know, the sheer diversity <laughs> of the kind. So how do you then in some ways fix? Um, so I think that leads me to the second uh, point that I really enjoyed about the presentation is I think a great use of methodologies, mixed methodologies, uh, where you very uh, productively combine then a survey plus interviews. Um, and I think at a larger level, what this does uh, for me is really it initiates and extends a conversation between uh, larger fields um, and disciplines of political science and anthropology. Um, I think there have been, there's always been much too little debate uh, and sort of cross pollination of ideas uh, across disciplines, across subfields, uh, across, across academicians and practitioners. And so I think, again, uh, the move that you make in this work to do that um, is really commendable. So moving on to a few comments um, and sort of questions that emerge out of the work, most of them are based on my own research and what I know of uh, through secondhand and thirdhand versions uh, of Indian cities. Um, the first is really that the study that you do takes as its point of departure individual slum leaders and how they come to be. And in fact, you uh, nicely detail out how such leaders operate within broader networks of relations. Um, you look at vertical, sort of the above to the party hierarchy, and you didn't focus on that today, but I'm sure you pointed out that it's part of another chapter. Uh, apart from the vertical uh, uh, set, set of network of relations, you also then look at the horizontal the relations with other community residents um, and potentially others or other leaders. So that was, I think, very nicely and neatly done. Uh, what I'm actually wondering here is, is there a spatial and temporal dimension to this work that I think you can more usefully bring out? Uh, for example, spatial embedding in a neighborhood, I think is extremely critical. Uh, I'm also saying this coming from the discipline broadly of urban planning and urban policy where space is very critical. Uh, but I do think the spatial embedding in a neighborhood uh, thinking and thinking about the history of settlement of particular bastis, and not just the history of the particular basti, but also its growth over time with respect to the city, the larger city's political economy. I think that is really crucial. And I do think that could be more usefully focused on and attended to. Uh, for example, then I think it would be some maybe more interesting patterns could emerge in terms of newer slums, peripheries versus older core city slums. Um, it would also shape, for example, whether leaders fix problems for only co-ethnics, because it depends then on the heterogeneity of the nature of the basti. I mean, because if the basti is much more homogenous, then, um, you know, so it depends on, I think, more of these. So maybe if I think putting some of your interview work more in conversation with the survey work would, uh, would help to detail out some of these patterns. The second broad thing that I wanted to actually highlight is really the question, which is a very, very important question that you raise in the work of knowledge of brokerage. Um, and really the question it brings to mind very sharply is what sort of knowing and knowledge is this? Uh, and you in fact squarely put some attention there, uh, but I think you focus much more on education and you use education as a proxy for this, uh, talking about things like awareness information. Um, and I think this is where I disagree with you, or at least I would push you to sort of expand a little bit more uh, because I, I think when I think about this idea of knowledge of, of brokerage or knowledge of slum leaders, um, is it that people actually want a different kind of knowledge and a different way of knowing that's connected to how to get things done? And can that kind of knowledge actually be conferred through formal education in a classroom, for example, uh, which is how most people think of education. So is this in fact a different kind of knowledge or different kind of way of knowing? Uh, maybe one can call it more tacit knowledge, um, something that's in fact learned uh, through experience, um, through practical knowledge, um, learning through in fact practice networks, 
Um, and so definitely built up over time, maybe collaboratively as well. Um, so I think maybe what, what could be useful here is to reflect a little on the spectrum of knowing from formal knowledge conferred by education, which I think definitely is important and has a place here, to then the practical knowledge conferred by experience. But I think maybe not to completely silence that part because I think it's in fact very critical. Um, the third point I wanted to highlight is really, the, again, the big question that you raised is why do slum leaders do this work? What words, in fact, I want to ask you here is what words do they use to explain uh, why they do this work? Um, and I'm particularly asking you this because um, in a lot of the work that I've done, I found that explanations are often given using ter terms and issues like doing social service, Samaj Seva, contributing to something larger than just themselves or their families. Um, and so I think there's something of this also at play here. It's certainly shaded by many other uh, more instrumental and individualistic views. Uh, but I think there is, again, some kind of a tension here between the instrumentalist and individualist view with one that is more embedded in a particular context and the sort of the web of broader social relations maybe even connections to ideas around sort of larger values like justice. These terms might not be used often in, you know, a similar word of justice might not be used, but the value, the, the structure of feeling, I think very much is communicated. So again, this, is, this tension I think is productive and maybe can be dwelt on more. The fourth point I want to make, which is sort of leading my, me to the conclusion of what I wanted to say is that, what is the future I think of such, uh, slum leadership and such brokerage. What are the emerging tra trajectories, the possibilities, as well as maybe even more importantly, the limits? Um, and I'm asking this particularly because you highlighted in your last point, I think this the fragmented nature of the politics. Um, and I think uh, Somya Deep also very usefully highlighted uh, this difference between everyday service delivery, everyday problems versus a more longer term sort of structural set of issues. Um, and I think this is really maybe then where we need to look at far more closely. I think particularly in the current context that we are looking at, for example, if we look at larger cities, you see increasingly real estate development and state capitalist forces are colonizing bastis for the land on which they sit. And in the commodification of land, slum leaders in fact play crucial roles as intermediaries. And this is a range, again, a range of responses. So it's not a singular role. There is participation and collusion. There is also overt resistance against the market entering uh, and displacing other local economies. So leaders are also complicit in their community's own dying and fragmentation. Um, but this happens in very differentiated and uneven ways. So I think then the question for me is, are smaller cities different? And I think what's really useful is your work highlights smaller cities. So maybe you can dwell a little bit more on this. What role then does the real estate economy and commodification of land play here vis-a-vis -vis slum leadership? And then how does, of course, it in turn shape uh, the preferences of, um, of residents? Um, and maybe also to think of this also in the context of growing majoritarian politics, which is again something uh, which we need to really contend with. Um, so finally, I'm going to leave it here, but to, but to sort of say that um, this leads me to really then say, what are the limits, the structural limits of resident agency in expressing their preferences for individual slum leaders? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kamath, for raising so many important issues. So I'm sure uh, Dr. Adam will respond to these very interesting questions. And before that, let me now invite uh, Dr. Patak to uh, please, if you, please share your thoughts on today's presentation. So what do you, Dr. Patak? Please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thank you, Somadeep, and thank you, Adam, very much for that uh, interesting presentation. In in some ways, uh, the story seems very familiar, and would be applicable to slums across the city, many cities in India. Uh, but in some ways, it seems quite uh, particular to second level cities or smaller cities that you have covered. Uh, what uh, I find interesting is that you have looked at Kachibastis 
and I'm presuming they are uh, non-secure, non-tenure secure status slums. So consciously you have chosen less secure slum status um, uh, in your sample. Was that a conscious choice or you wanted to look at differences across different times, types of slums with more secure and less secure tenure status? That's a question to my mind because tenure status doesn't even appear as one of the activities of the slum leaders. So that's one question are centered around the tenure status of the sample that you have selected. And if you could dwell on that. The second question uh, that I have is around the nature of slum leadership itself that evolves over time. So is the slum leadership a permanent status or residents reassess over a period of time if they have been successful or not successful in responding to their needs and they change their leaders. So this is the long-term leadership status in these localities and what kind of role residents play and how do they express themselves in choosing new leaders? So that's the second set of questions uh, that are centered around the over time temporal nature of these leadership. Um, the third um, uh, set of questions is that the political aspirations of this, these leaders themselves, as you have said, and that's very interesting and quite normal that slum leaders want to have a greater say and a greater position in the governance structure of the city, be, be it ward level, be it municipal level. So in your cases that you have studied, were there any examples that some leaders actually got into local governance or acquired position other than party positions in municipal structure at some level or the other, either ward level or selected municipal councillors. So was this their, their aspiration fulfilled as they desired? So I would leave my three sets of questions uh, for Adam to dwell on, and it will be very interesting to hear the discussion that will follow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Patrick. And let me now uh, straightly move over to Dr. Adam for a response to all the queries, all the views which are presented, which are mentioned by our discussion. So it's over to you, Dr. Thank you. And I mean, please let me start by, I mean, just thank you so much for those absolutely fascinating questions um, to both the discussants, um, you know, all, all immensely important. Um, so I think I'll start with the, the most recent question and, and, and move backwards from that. Um, so Dr. Patrick, yes. Um, we, we show, and this is something, a focus of chapter four of our book, um, that these aspirations certainly to move up within the, the party organization are realized by many um, slum leaders, um, moving up in their positions, you know, from the booth level to the ward, to the block or mandal, to the sheher, you know, to the district, they move up within the party, party organization. Um, many um, do actually end up getting a, a party ticket, especially those that are residing in kachibastis that are very large. Um, that constitute almost, you know, uh, most of the ward's population. Um, so, you know, so, some of our slum leaders in our sample um, do, do end up actually getting party tickets. Um, less, less aspirations, I think, being filled in terms of this um, launching them into a, a career um, outside of politics. Um, much of the connectivity that we discussed earlier was sort of um, an initial function of what propelled them into slum leadership, not something that they ultimately attained through slum leadership. Um, so, yeah, I think, you know, the, the short answer to that really important question is that there's significant political upward mobility um, to many, for many of these, um, these informal slum leaders within party organizations um, and leading some of them to getting a, a party ticket to fight in a municipal, um, in, in a municipal election. Um, in terms of uh, the status of slum leadership over time, um, it's, it's really interestingly most certainly not permanent. 
um, it really rests on um, demonstrated efficacy in getting things done. Um, and so, uh, especially in, um, and this is something that I really get into in my first book that came out a few years ago, um, when, when you trace the, the micro histories of these neighborhoods, um, there's a really interesting rise and fall um, in the political careers of different slum leaders, um, largely due to um, who in the existing sort of crop of slum leaders are, are being the most effective and people gravitating towards some over others. There's always new crops of younger residents um, that are sort of coming of age um, with sort of new skills, um, you know, higher rates of um, education um, to break into slum leadership and challenge um, the informal authority of existing slum leaders. Um, so there's a real churn um, and much of that being underpinned by demonstrated efficacy in problem solving. Um, so it's, it's certainly something where you have to continue to demonstrate that um, or you're really risking um, in, in other instances in my ethnographic field work, um, some slum leaders, once, once they had this informal authority, would turn to using dadagiri, um, you know, like forcefully using themselves to sort of push other people around. Um, I saw many instances of residents um, explicitly punishing uh, slum leaders who really sort of crossed the line and transgressed um, on residents, you know, residents coming to their house with chapels or sort of stones um, to, to push back against uh, transgressions. Um, again, speaking to the, the political agency of residents in the story. Um, I'm so glad that you asked about the type of settlements. Um, really important. We specifically focus on squatter settlements, um, settlements that emerge on greenfield sites, um, you know, without any sort of land title. No one has a patta um, at first, of course, absolutely no goods or services, um, and differentiate those um, in, our, in, in our sample frame um, from old city slums, um, so in Jaipur and Bhopal, these would be in the Purana Shahir, um, you know, neighborhoods that are in some instances several centuries old, um, that are quite dilapidated, um, sometimes um, colloquially referred to in Jaipur and Bhopal as kachibastis, but they're fundamentally different than these squatter settlements that have emerged in the last um, 20, 30, 40 years um, throughout the city that are sort of classic squatter settlements. Um, we also differentiate them from urban villages, um, from post-eviction resettlement colonies, um, so yeah, we, um, you know, we, we spent quite a bit of time um, not just sort of taking the lists from the cities and saying, these are, these are, this is the list of slums, we're just going to sample from them, um, being specific about sort of what type of neighborhood we're talking about. Um, and because of that, as you suggested, because we focus on squatter settlements, kachibastis, um, these are overwhelmingly sort of insecure spaces in terms of um, formalized property rights. Um, some neighborhoods have been regularized um, and some have gotten actual sort of puttas. Um, it gets even more complicated than that. I mean, um, in the 1980s, Arjun Singh, the chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, gave out sort of one in 30 year puttas, um, which have now long since lapsed, that people will still sort of hold on to them because it sort of gives them some sort of, you know, address and footing in the neighborhood. Um, so there's a whole sort of range. Um, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, two of my colleagues, Anirudh Krishna and Emily Rains, do a really great job showing the sort of the many um, shades of gray. Uh, between sort of not having any patta and having sort of a full title. Um, but yeah, we specifically focus on squatter settlements. Um, and your last, I mean, your first comment on the size of cities, really important, right? I mean, one of the reasons why we focus on Jaipur and Bhopal is that most people living in slum settlements in India do not live in Mumbai and Delhi and Chennai and, you know, Bangalore and Kolkata. They live in these tier two cities in this huge constellation of smaller towns spread throughout the country. Um, so, you know, in picking any particular city or, you know, one, two, three, however many it is, they're gonna have some idiosyncrasies that make them a little bit different than other places. So for instance, Jaipur and Bhopal, I mean, this is BJP and Congress are the only game in town. If we had done our project in Uttar Pradesh or Bihar or West Bengal, you know, there'd be a different, um, <clears throat> excuse me, ecosystem of parties. Um, but yeah, city size, of course, is very important in terms of um, state capacity, um, the extent of decentralization, um, the, the, the network of political parties, lots of things, um, you know, to the, so really stressing the importance of contextualizing the, the cities that we've selected. Um, Dr. Kamath, I mean, again, like um, absolutely fascinating questions. Yeah, the, um, the words that oftentimes that you would describe, if you just say like, you know, um, you know, in terms of, in terms of their actual sort of nitigiri, many of them say that they're doing samaj seva, <clears throat> uh, social work, um, understanding it as such. Um, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's easy to be sort of cynical and, 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 and understanding that they're just sort of saying that, but they're getting all these material goods. But I don't think that that can be minimized. Um, many of them understand their activities, at least in part, as improving their neighborhood, um, you know, for, as its own end. 
Um, so I think that can't be just, you know, as you're suggesting, that's simply sort of dismissed. Um, and also seeking out respect and dignity um, uh, within their communities um, for themselves um, and, their, and people within their networks. Um, <clears throat> education, as you suggest, um, certainly goes beyond formal education. Um, you know, uh, literacy, you know, the ability to read and write um, certainly is important in terms of the flurry of um, uh, petitions that they write um, to the municipality or to politicians to get things for the settlement. So there, there are some, you know, certainly, you know, elements of that. Um, but as you said, a lot of this is experiential. Um, it's not something that like, you know, you have a high school or college degree and suddenly you know how to go to the district collector's office and do everything. Um, a lot of it is this sort of, you know, uh, entrepreneurial sweat, experiential knowledge, um, a grittiness um, that uh, many of these individuals have that go beyond sort of formal education. Um, so I, I really appreciate that point. That's something I think that we can, we can expand upon much more um, in, in our work. I also um, deeply appreciate your um, suggestions to theorize more about sort of what's going on at the city level, um, not only just be in the weeds um, in the neighborhoods, but what's going on in the, the, in the political economy of the city, the spatial nature of this. Um, you know, I have a sort of a newer project with a colleague of mine, Tanu Kumar, um, on, you know, the peripheries, at least of Jaipur and Bhopal, um, are not really even kachi busties anymore, as, as, as I sort of understood them in my, in my earlier work. They are unauthorized colonies that are lower middle class, developed by private developers, um, that are not authorized by the Vikas Pradhikaran, by the Development Authority, um, and they have their own politics to them. They're much more likely to be homogenous in terms of religion and jati. Um, and so they're, they're fundamentally different spaces um, than Kachi Bastis. And I think that's just one example, you know, of the importance of considering space and, and temporality. Um, and then the, the last thing that I'll say is, um, yes, I mean, our entire conclusion of our book dwells on um, this grassroots politics that we're examining. What does this mean in a sort of a post-2014 India? Um, these multi-ethnic networks that we examine, um, you know, uh, not only in terms of Jati, but in terms of religion, um, can we expect them to um, come under greater strain um, with, with um, Hindu majoritarianism, um, with, with um, arising discourses, um, a centralization of power um, in, in Delhi. Um, what does that mean for sort of local brokerage and local sort of city politics? Um, and so, yeah, we spend actually much of the final chapter sort of dwelling on these sort of thoughts and um, I don't know, maybe hand wavy is not the right word, but it's, it's sort of thinking about where this might be going in the future. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to sharing, you know, that with you and, and hearing what you think, but I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adam, for your uh, responses to almost all the queries which have been raised. And then also I'm saying that there are some questions uh, in the Q&A box and also in the chat box. And one question is related to uh, this Partha Chatterjee's uh, thesis of survival politics of poor, uh, which is uh, I think uh, Professor Tathagata Chatterjee has uh, mentioned this particular question, like how the urban poor shift their political alignments, because obviously this is very much evident in uh, our state West Bengal. And did you see the similar patterns? This is uh, the question from Professor Tathagata Chatterjee. And also there is another question uh, from Dr. Sigdel. Uh, it's about the suggestions from you regarding the permanent solution on the issues of the slums or increment in the number of slums in the South Asia. Uh, and the third uh, question is in the chat box. So uh, it's from uh, Arun Kumar. And this is about uh, the, uh, the Islam leader's ability to do violence or the perception of it. Uh, did it play any role? Uh, who gets established as a Islam leader either in Jaipur and Bhopal? And the second uh, uh, question is uh, the importance of this caste or religion of these Islam leaders on their uh, on their ability to solve day-to-day uh, -day problems. So your responses to these, to some of these issues. Arun Kumar ji is also here. Would you like to ask? No, I think the question has been summarized pretty well by so many. It's okay. All right, please go ahead, Dr. And just another uh, thing. I'm just saying that uh, Shamala Mani has raised her hand. So, uh, Shamala, would you like to? or just? Uh, and, and not, I mean, actually, okay, uh, Arjun see. just wanted me to, yeah, I come from an environmental background, uh, Adam, and uh, I was just interested to know whether, uh, uh, you know, the slum leaders, of course, provide, uh, uh, you know, this kind of services, like, you know, getting a ration card or getting an Aadhaar card or one of those things. But uh, has the municipality or, uh, or the municipal corporation ever tried to 
use the leaders for actual uh, improvement of uh, you know certain conditions or certain behavior or certain schemes or you know to improve the slum you know environmentally so it, uh, not only the residents using the netas for uh, their uh, to get their uh, work done but has the municipality ever used the netas to actually improve the slums that was my question thank you thank you thank you uh, uh, professor man so yes it's over to you um incredible questions i mean just to start with the uh, the last one thank you for that um i've never seen anything that like really programmatically sort of bakes um, informal slum leadership sort of into explicit um, engagements with these communities. Um, usually the sort of the assumption is that we're, we're, you know, we'll have to build sort of new community-based organizations or get the community together and, and, and have them sort of select somebody for these sort of one-off projects. But that said, I mean, there's something, you know, much of the activities that I've explained are, are you know, very informal, but there's something, there, there's a gray area in between. So Whenever there's sort of Sarkati Chikitsa camps, you know, government medical camps or ration car drives, um, you know, the MLA of the area, um, you know, people within the Nagar Nigam um, working in particular settlements, they, they have a very nuanced sense of who these, who these slum leaders are um, and will often be interfacing with them to mobilize residents um, and help with sort of setting it up. Much of that will have a political bent to it. Um, but yeah, there's, there's certainly a world between sort of these sort of quotidian bottom up everyday politics and sort of more programmatic top-down you know, policy and programs um, where some leaders are sort of engaged, um, even if not explicitly so, um, said so in the, in the project. So it's a, it's a really, really fascinating question and, and you know, for something to, to consider. Um, um, in terms of Dr. Chatterjee's question, yeah, I mean, Partha Chatterjee's book on you know, political, political society and his work on political society has of course been um, you know, really important uh, you know, in our study. It's something that we engage a lot. I mean, one of the points that we're trying to make in the book is that, yes, um, you know, political society, parties, um, protests, brokers, um, you know, very much are the are the things um, of politics in terms of getting things done. Uh, but one of the one of the main points that we're trying to make in our book is that this is political society is not just the world. These brokers and parties are not just things that exist above um, the urban poor that they're using to gain access to the states. The urban poor through their agency are actively shaping the networks of political society. Um, by making these grassroots decisions, um, because then politicians need to rely on these decisions um, and the informal leaders that emerge within communities um, in their own structure um, of, of networks in the city. Um, so what we're trying to sort of do is, is, is move beyond sort of this sort of generalized statement about how um, marginalized urban citizens get things done to saying that they're actually active participants in crafting these networks um, in the first place with really important implications for really understanding in a nuanced sense who actually benefits from state, the states and who does not um, and who's left off. Um, so that's, that's sort of how we sort of engage this. In terms of political alignment, um, about a third of our um, ordinary slum residents in our, in our sample um, said that they've changed their votes for political parties over the last several elections. Um, and we think that's probably an underestimate. So there's significant sort of swing voters um, in these right. neighborhoods of people sometimes voting for the BJP and sometimes voting for the Congress. Sorry, I think I heard, I just heard somebody um, weighing in. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, yeah, please carry on. Yeah, so yeah, lots of sort of party switching. I know, and I, I want to be mindful of time and see if there's other questions too, but um, yeah, and uh, in terms of, um, I mean, suggestions, I mean, this is obviously a huge question and a difficult thing to take on, you know, in the, in the last few minutes, but I mean, clearly, you know, much of this is, um, you know, a story of, of informality and, um, you know, un unauthorized status, lack of access to property rights, um, the um, precarity that is generated by that. Um, and as we all know, it's, it's largely a political problem. And this is not obviously not unique to India. Um, you know, it, it sort of amazed me, you know, in, in, in interviews and engagements with politicians that they would oftentimes explicitly say that, look, we'll give people Pani, we'll give people Pakarasta, we'll give them a Nali. Um, but a pata, um, you know, is something to worry about because it breaks that dependency relationship. Um, suddenly, you know, they can gain access to these things a little bit easier. They're less reliant on me as the politician. Um, and so it creates these sort of, um, you know, unfortunate um, incentives of a low, you know, of, of, of this equilibrium um, of an extension in precarity um, stemming from, uh, from a lack of property rights. Um, so I think, you know, as, as many people have, have already sort of, um, you know, examined in their own scholarship and, and policy work, you know, this really sits at the core of a lot of this um, and larger sort of questions of gaining access to the city. Um, 
yeah, I think I think that's yeah, I think I'll leave it there, but thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adam. Like uh, it's the, the uh, today's discussion has really been uh, quite engaging and and today's talk uh, uh, gives insights into how the slums functions, both in terms of how the leaders are picked, uh, ranging from uh, discussion among the residents uh, to their uh, gradual emergence over time by uh, mainly, as you mentioned, that demonstrating their ability to get things done and, and also the, uh, the agency that the residents enjoy. And this discussion also, I think, highlights the importance of uh, understanding the nature and levels of uh, political organization agencies to, to frame suitable policies for, uh, for addressing the slum vulnerabilities. Now, one thing is uh, pretty clear that we need to explore these relationships in more detail, these nuances in more detail and with an open mind. And we hope uh, to have you in our future uh, City Conversation series as well. So uh, with this uh, uh, thing, I, again, on behalf of the IMPRI, Team IMPRI, uh, I thank uh, all the participants and also uh, especially uh, Dr. Adam Orbeck and uh, uh, Dr. Lalita Kamath and Dr. Krishna Patak for uh, uh, being here with us, uh, sharing their views. And then now may I now request uh, Arunima to formally propose the vote of thanks. Uh, thank you. As we come to the end of this extremely enlightening discussion, I, Arunima Marwa, researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, New Delhi, would like to formally propose a vote of thanks on behalf of the Center for Habitat, Urban and Regional Studies, IMPRI. We are grateful to our speaker, Dr. Adam Orbach, and our moderator, Dr. Somadeep Chattopadhyay, for taking out the time for being with us for this thought-provoking talk on informal leadership and development in India's urban slum. Thank you. We also thank our discussants, Dr. Pushpa Pathak and Dr. Lalita Kamath for adding their diverse perspectives and valuable insights to this deliberation. And of course, we thank all our participants who are here on Zoom or on Facebook Live for participating and also to our viewers who will be watching us later on YouTube or listening to our podcast. Thank you again. And I hope you continue to tune in on future episodes of hashtag City Conversations series, as well as other lines of deliberations of IMPRI, hashtag Web Policy Talk. Good night. Thank you and good night to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Patak and Dr. Kamath also. Yeah. Thank you so much.